Hi everyone, it's Jerry. I have an instructive game to share with you from the 1997 Linares tournament. On the white end, Alexei Shirov playing against Garry Kasparov. So let's see this light square strategy in action by Kasparov. Really an excellent game ahead out of this opened Sicilian Nidorf. Bishop e3, white aims for the English attack. Far and away most popular from this position. e5, knight b3, bishop e6, and f3. f3 controls the g4 square. No knight jump there to bother the bishop. In this game, Kasparov jumps at the opportunity to bother the bishop before f3 is in. This is noted as the anti-English attack. The reply, bishop g5. The bishop can, of course, go back home. And this knight can return to its favorite square. We could repeat moves and have a quick three-fold repetition draw. Should white play in this way, well, that would be a crime against chess, or at least that's what Mikhail Tall thought. No worries of a quick draw. With these two dynamic players on board, we are in for a fight. Bishop g5 it is. Some tempi gained against the dark square bishop. And in the process, space for Kasparov on the king's side. With that space comes some weaknesses. h5 is a hole. f5 is a bit more weakened. Bishop g7. The reply now, bishop e2. Considered better is h3. h3 will scare the knight away. Bishop e2, not so much. The reply is h5, a move that is both defensive and aggressive. In what way is it aggressive? Well, if white tries h3 one move later, there is h4. This move now tracks the dark square bishop. The knight covers its retreat square. So, in this game it is bishop takes knight. By the way, something I noted with this game. This is the first case where when one of Kasparov's minor pieces is attacked, it doesn't move. It's almost like time and time again, he just refuses to react to his opponent's threats. Simply secures the knight right now. Bishop takes knight. Bishop takes bishop. This is the imbalance we play with. Light square bishop versus knight. Currently things are cool for white with the structure and bishop. Pawns light, bishop dark. Great. What will be a good strategy for black in general? Playing with this unopposed light square bishop? Well, try and create holes on the light squares in white's camp. The more holes you can create on light squares, that's going to be good news for the light square bishop. Its eyes will widen. Its prospects will improve. All right, we continue with castles. Knight c6. Where else is that knight going to go? There's a problem now on d4. White must tend to that. Note certain moves that aren't played in this position. h4 may be tempting g4 as well. Knight c6, we can say, retains the flexibility with these pawns. Maybe h4, maybe g4. Keep white guessing. All right, the reply is bishop f2. If white tries to take advantage of one of the gaps on black's king side, for instance, knight f5, black can swipe the knight and then land a check on b6 and say thank you for the b-pawn. Bishop f2 not only covers the knight, but covers that queen b6 idea. At the same time, white has released the pressure on d6, and this allows e6. e6 covers the knight f5 jump. A couple new squares available for the queen as well. D6 is a downside. D6 is currently unprotected, but at the moment not accessible. 
The reply now is knight c to e2. If white exchanges a pair of knights here, black is recapturing with the bishop, making sure d6 is defended. And if white continued with bishop d4, a good reply would be bishop e5, saying I, I'm okay taking on isolated center pawns because I would have some square to pivot to on d4. All right, in this game, knight c to e2, Kasparov now says, I know what you're up to. You want to exchange a pair of knights, and after I recapture, you're going to go from rank 2 to rank 4. I don't want you to have such an easy time with that, so let's avoid the knight exchange. White does have a lot of pieces competing for that one square. Maybe a good idea for white to get rid of one of those pieces so there isn't that great of a competition going on over d4. The knight from e5 has an eye on maybe c4. White rules that one out with b3 also supports a c4 advance. The computer isn't a big fan of b3. It likes c3 as a... Uh, c prefers c3 over b3. If later knight c4... You could then give it a kick. There's a bit of an issue with b3. I wonder if you can spot what that is. Uh, can you spot Kasparov's next move? Feel free to pause the video. Okay. Now, I must admit, when I see b3, one of the first things that comes to mind for me is this weakness on c3. Is there something I could maybe do along this diagonal? Is there a way to take advantage of a pin, maybe? There isn't. Uh, this is an unusual situation we have here. The downside with b3 is only revealed after a couple pawn moves. The best move in this position, move played, g4. This is the beginning of black breaking down white's pawns that are on light squares. With every white pawn that's on a light square, well, whenever you can make one of white's pawns that's on a light square move, you're creating a light square weakness. The reply is f4. There we go. There's now a weakness on e4, e4 as a whole. What is the reply now? One more pop quiz. What would you play here? Okay, well, the knight is attacked, but as mentioned earlier, there seems to be this pattern where when a minor piece is attacked, it doesn't move. <laughs> Instead, he continues to push his pawns h4 on board. So now there's maybe h3, or even g3, which would ensure some file is cracked open if it hits with a fork, even if it costs a pawn. What is going on here, though, if the knight is captured? In the game, it's bishop e3. If the knight is captured, black takes with the pawn. Now, when you do a quick glance of this position, you might say, oh, this, this is a fourth-ranked knight right in the center. It has a lot of options. Well, guess what? When you play b3, you've taken away one of the few remaining options from that knight. It has no moves. This would be Kasparov's way to get that piece back. And in general, he, he's probably the one who is benefiting with more pawn exchanges more open diagonals, more open files. This is going to be good news for the side with the bishop pair. So white doesn't go for this sequence. Instead, bishop e3 gets out of the g3 move um, with the fork, cracking open the king, uh, king side there. Still doesn't have to move the knight. In comes h3 now, continuing to break down the light squares in white's camp. White can definitely, uh, well, white cannot afford to make a capture on h3. This would activate the rook and be the best piece in the game. g3 in this game. So there is a hole on g2, f3, e4, big problems for white. The computer is going to say right around here, it's still equal-ish, but things that are tipping in Black's favor long-term 
King's safety is a problem for white. Black is already thinking about somehow getting this queen right here, g2 for mate. There's no direct variation into that square, but in general, the more the position opens up, the more accessible the white king will be, the more vulnerable it will be. All right, from here, knight c6. You could also castle because the same situation here, you would get the piece back after the pawn recaptures, but he goes back to c6. Queen d3 castles. And from here, it is rook a to d1. If white tries to break with f5, in this position, black can take, and the knight is not in a spot to recapture because there, there's a capture, and then this rook would fall. So, rook a to d1. This may now be an idea, now that there is no longer a pin, but black is there. First, he continues to chip away at the light squares. He's now controlling another hole in white's camp with a pawn. All of these squares under black's control. Where to go from here? It is c4. Queen a5. You know, for many moves in this game, I was wondering to myself, why isn't he playing rook to c8? It seemed like a reasonable move going to a half open file. He has a different idea in mind with this rook in this game. Also, in many cases, uh, maybe this rook move was delayed because queenside castles might have been an option he wanted to go forward with. Now that these kingside pawns are all the way up here. Retaining some options by not moving that queen rook. Queen a5 in this game. Knight c3, rook a to e8. And with this move, the rook will find activity on the e-file one way or the other. Certainly, if white continues here with a capture on f5, we take with the e-pawn and we say thank you for opening up the e-file. What if white plays a move like rook f to e1, move played in the game? Here's the other detail. In comes e5, creating more tension. The e-file is going to crack open by force. There is a fork here. This is good news, again, for the side with the safer king. Again, black has dreams of getting the queen to g2 somehow or another. The reaction, knight takes on c6. Something you can't do, something you should definitely not do, is take on e5 and invite this knight into e5 with tempo and then eyeing up the f3 square. No way. In this game, it's knight takes c6, bishop takes c6, and now b4. Okay, the reply to this is queen to a3. This is considered the best, the very best move. Why is this pawn not picked up? Well, black is avoiding knight d5 with tempo. You certainly wouldn't want to take the knight here and invite the queen in with check. If the queen goes here or here, there's this as a capture. It still prefers black, but... Uh, this here is the very best. Queen a3. Doesn't give white an opportunity to advance a piece with tempo. There's a pin on the knight as well. The reply in this game is b5. If the knight tries to go into d5 here, black can exchange queens and then break down the center, taking on f4, taking on e4 next. All right, in this game, it is b5. F takes, excuse me, e takes f4 first, opens up this pressure on c3. Bishop takes f4, a, b, c, b, and a nice check thrown in here. Queen c5 right away. This demotes the bishop. It's no longer observing d6, and the rook is no longer securing e4. Only after demoting the bishop does black take on c3. Pawn takes bishop, getting the piece back. 
queen takes on c6, queen takes d6, queen takes e4. Possible, because the bishop is on e3, not f4. And finally, black is in a spot, coordinating with the most advanced pawn, h3. We have a mate on g2. White has to get the queens off. And does queen d5, but white is down the pawn. Queen takes queen, rook takes queen, and nice follow up here, bishop c3. There is a bit of a pin here. The bishop still has a couple moves where it will secure the rook, by, but by flicking in bishop c3, it pulls the rook to e2, and now this guy has no moves because the rook would simply fall. So only after creating this inconvenience do we have the doubling on the e-file. And there's no good way to get out of this pin. What is tried, rook d3. Note where the bishop retreats here. Bishop f6. Doesn't go back to a secure square, a square where the king is defending the bishop. There's a detail here I want you to take note of the difference between bishop g7 and bishop f6. I'll be highlighting this very soon. The reply now is rook on d, or rook on e to d2. One final move in this position. I wonder if you can spot it. Feel free to pause the video. Okay, here it is. Rook takes bishop and white resigns. Now, First of all, if white gets off of this file by going to c2, here is how black can continue. You could take the bishop and then play bishop to d4 with this pin. And if this rook goes here, this is a forever pin, an eternal pin. You cannot get out of it. Black would have all day to put the king here, play f5. Capture a couple times, and then this will be attacked three times, and it's only defended twice. So that's one of many ways to continue in this exact position. Why does white in this game play to this square? Well, it's to cover this bishop d4 follow-up. The downside of going to d2 here is... This detail, after rook takes bishop, if the game continued from here, it would follow rook takes rook, rook takes rook, and note in this position, because the bishop is on f6, not g7, white doesn't have this check first, and only then the capture. King takes rook, bishop g5 would land here. This is how black gets the piece back. And in the end, in this simplified ending, we're able to push through. Up the pawn, in comes f4. G takes f4, in comes g3. H takes g3. Pawn quality, black wins a step away from queening. This one goes no further, though. After rook takes bishop on e3, Shirov resigns. So interesting how this one played out in the opening, in the middle game. Kasparov's play was on the light squares. And in this ending, there ended up being a tactic on the dark squares of all squares. Interesting how that happens. What are your thoughts? Anyhow, feel free, as usual, to leave any feedback to this video in the comment section below. I hope you enjoyed it and maybe took a thing or two away. That's all for now. Take care. Bye.